Good morning and welcome to the 27th meeting of Social Justice and uh, Social Security Committee. We have no apologies today. So our first item of business in public for today is a decision on taking item 7 in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. So our next item of business today is a consideration of a Scottish statutory instrument the Social Security Genuine and Sufficient Link to the United Kingdom, Miscellaneous Amendment, Scotland Regulations 2024. This instrument is subject to the negative procedure. And the main purpose of this instrument is to amend a range of regulations in relation to the past presence test and the genuine and sufficient link to the United Kingdom by removing references to social security system so that the genuine and sufficient link simply needs to be to the United Kingdom. Do members have any comments on the instrument? So I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any further recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are members content to note the instrument? Yeah, okay, thank you. So our next agenda item is our final evidence session as part of our annual pre-budget scrutiny. So this year our focus is on how the Scottish Government's approach to fair and efficient funding can support the ongoing effectiveness of the third sector. And I welcome our panel of witnesses, Erica Judge, Director of Funds Inspiring Scotland. Neil Rich, Scotland Director, the National Lottery Community Fund, and Professor Tobias Young, Professor of Management, University of St Andrews, and Karen Arrow, Funding Manager, the Robertson Trust, who is joining us online. So thank you all very much for accepting our invitations. And just before we move on to the questions, a few points to mention about the format of the meeting. So please wait until I or a member asking the questions see your name before speaking. Please allow our broadcasting colleagues a few seconds to turn your microphone on before you start to speak. And Karen, if you could just indicate an, an R in the, in the chat room in Zoom if you wish to come in on a question as well. And can I ask everyone to keep questions and answers as concise as possible. So I'm now going to invite members um, to ask questions in turn. So I'm going to invite Bob Doris in first of all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner, and good morning to all our witnesses. Uh, thank you for supporting our, our budget scrutiny. Um, I'd like to ask um, about longer-term funding for uh, the third sector. Clearly, that's, that's been a key ask for, for some time, and I'm conscious that both the Robertson Trust and Inspiring Scotland have put in submissions to this committee that you're trying, where possible, to give that longer-term uh, security to organisations that are successful in getting grants from yourself. So perhaps we could maybe start off with uh, Carnero. Could you maybe say a little bit about uh, why you do this, put that on the record, what you feel the benefits are, and maybe give a, sp a specific example of the difference that you think it's made to some of the, the awardees, Karen? Yeah, of course. Um, and first of all, just to say thank you so much for having me today. I'm really um, pleased to have the opportunity to contribute and share some of our work. Um, so, yeah, as mentioned in our submission, we are really pleased that the majority of our large and small grants um, for two years or more, so about 96%. And actually, the majority of those um, will be three-year awards because we really try not to make um, awards for a shorter dura duration than that unless an organisation requests it um, because we just feel there's real value in committing to, to longer-term funding. And we're actually uh, really delighted to have recently committed our first 10-year award as well towards the Edinburgh Regenerative Futures Fund, which is a pooled community fund for Edinburgh involving a number of funders. Um, which places decision making within the hands of the community, and we're really interested to see what learning about the benefits of longer term, like really longer term funds, will come out of that. Um, but we feel as a funder, and we hear from our funded organisations that there are a number of benefits um, to providing long term funding, and we feel primarily that longer term funding can actually be more impactful. 
um, because it means that organisations we find can concentrate on sort of developing and delivering their services. They're not having to apply for funding year in, year out and work on a sort of project to project basis. Um, you know, they can better work towards achieving longer term impact, they've got greater stability. Um, we feel it gives the funded work a better chance of success as well, because with that stability and security, um, organisations are able to sort of recruit and retreat, they retain sorry, skilled staff. So that drives up the quality of their delivery. Um, there, there aren't gaps in provision. Um, and again, it, it contributes towards sort of improving the impact of their work. Um, and we know as well that from much, as our, much of our work, that change and achieve an impact really takes time. Um, so multi-year funding over the longer term gives organisations the, the chance to achieve that. And although most of our awards are for three years, we've actually found that in some cases that's not even quite enough. You know, if a five-year award would, would be more appropriate because we recognise it takes time for organisations to recruit staff, to build relationships with participants and with stakeholders and, and to give their work a real chance of success. Um, so we, we really would advocate as much as possible yeah. for that. Karen, and I apologise for I apologise for cutting across you, and uh, it's all relevant elements, and the rest would have been really valuable. Also, I just want to give some of your colleagues an opportunity to add to that. Sorry. So, so, so I apologise, um, Erica Judge. I think that's possibly been your experience as well. So, if I mean, I'm not saying don't repeat what's been said, but if there's anything in addition, or just to reinforce that point, could I throw a second question at you? If that's okay, Erica, because we did hear. Them in evidence that there could be some unintended consequence of longer term funding. It's not a reason not to do it, but I think Glasgow City Council and the Cora Foundation uh, spoke about the possibility of uh, those getting the awards but overly dependent potentially in one funder, that that could be a risk. Uh, and we've also heard in previous evidence that you lock in that long term approach for those that win the awards, but it also locks out those that are not successful. So any reflections on that? But also, if you want to add to any of Karen's points, that would also be very helpful, Erica. You're good to go. OK, good. Thank you. Um, well, I would agree with everything Karen said, and I would just add to it. Inspiring Scotland was actually founded with the ambition of providing long-term funding. So we, our approach ideally is to give tenure funding, um, manage through close uh, fund management and relationship-based management. Um, and, but we don't always do that because of, the way, uh, because of our funding model, which where we gather funds inward. But in terms of a, the kind of benefits, if I give an example of one of our programs, Our Future Now, which is in its fifth year of funding, where we work closely with 12 organizations, um, and as a follow-on to our initial 10-year fund, we are able, because we work very closely with these organizations, to collect a lot of data, very robust data over time, and to interrogate that data to be able to understand what's actually working. And then because we have close relationships with those charities, we are then able to tweak the model and try to drive better performance. Um, I think the argument about dependency, I wouldn't agree with. Um, again, if I refer to our future now, what having that stability of funding allows our charities to do and allows us to do is to raise more money from more diverse sources. And it en enables the charities that we're supporting also to go out and, and match that funding from other fundings, other, other funders. So I see, in, in fact, less dependency through this model. Okay, and that's it. Can I just check, uh, Erica, judge whether uh, that means that the percentage of funds you get. So if, uh, uh, if a project's one hundred thousand pound, would you, would the Spanish got maybe only fund twenty percent of that or fifteen percent of that to avoid that dependency? That you talk about, and are there any issues about? locking those unsuccessful out of the uh, process. Right. So if I just address the, the question of locking unsuccessful organizations out, one thing I would say, because I also um, manage funds that where we have year-to-year -year funding, primarily from the Scottish yeah. Government, and what tends to happen, because the time frame is so short for everybody and there's so much work involved, that a lot of the funding actually gets rolled over for much longer than if you actually planned to have a three-year fund or a five-year fund and had a kind of process to do that. So I would say the unintended consequence of year-on-year -year funding is, is less opportunity to review, refresh, and to invite new applicants. 
Okay, that's helpful. If, maybe just ask one final question, and I won't be open up to either Professor uh, Jung or, or, or Neil, Neil Rich. Um, clearly, we'd be looking for the Scottish Government and its agencies to provide longer term funding certainty for the, the third sector. Uh, I'm conscious that they don't always have full sight of what their budgets will be for the longer term. So, for example, there will be a UK budget on the 30th of October which will give an idea of Scottish Government budgets, but then early next year there will also be a spending review, which may lead to in-year revisions, let alone what is going to happen in year two, year three, year four. Mr Rich, would you recognise that is maybe a, a challenge for the Scottish Government and other public agencies? And how, could they, how could they circumvent that to give that longer term funding that we would all like to see? A nice easy one to start for you, Mr. Rich. Well, if I knew that, I might be doing a different job. Um, I think I think there's a couple of things. Uh, some of this is about funding scheme design, and so you can have a risk of in any funding scheme you have winners and losers. You make yes no decisions, um, but the, the extent to which there are people who are locked in and locked out depends on the rhythm of that funding stream. So this to get to longer term funding is about managing a change. Process. So, at the National Lottery Community Fund, our average um, main grants are around three years, and we often fund for much longer than that in different arrangements, up to ten years and, and more at times. And in doing that, and we're in the process of developing new programmes right now, moving to more of a five-year horizon. Um, we're conscious that you need to think about how you shape your budgets over a period of time. Now, government um, is both challenged by having annualised budgeting but also empowered by having more money than any of the rest of us. Um, so this is about choices. It's always about choices. And about, so, so national lottery funding, for example, is predicated on a projection of future national lottery income. Um, and all of our grants are, are, are mortgaged against the future. So, so we make an assumption that we will have money in the future um, and, and manage that risk. And I think lots of this conversation is actually about how we sensibly take an evidence-based approach to managing risk in funding. So that's, uh, that would be my uh, best guess at how government might handle that. That's, that's very helpful. I won't have any, any further questions, but uh, Tobias, did you want to add, add to that before my colleagues come in? Yeah, if it's all right. Can I be frank? Yes. Because I'm not sure if you're asking the right question in this document. So for the NF research, like the field for the last 15 years, and these questions have been around as long. And the answers and evidence base, I think, is like pretty well established around like how we approach long-term funding, the benefits and issues around long-term funding. I think there are secondary questions, because what should come beforehand is what is the actual vision for the third sector? Is it about public sector and public service deliveries? Is it about innovation? Is it about advocacy, holding government responsibility? And I think as long as we don't have a clarity on what the overarching vision for that is, it's like all the answers to these questions depend really. Because coming back to the question of long-term funding benefit, across from St Andrews is Dundee. It's like according to Dave, um, Dundee Barons, like one in three children in Dundee live in poverty. According to what is the Dundee Poverty Index right now, 28.7% of the children are in poverty there. So do they, right now it's school holidays, so they're not getting school meals, so probably they'll be hungry. So do they need long-term funding? No, no, right now they need to be fed. That's like your short-term funding. They need to be fed for the whole next week. That will be the short-term funding. Will that address the underlying issue? No, for that you'll need the long-term funding. So it's like it's the move from alleviating existing circumstances to being strategic in addressing the underlying ones going forward. And so I think like some of the questions we've got here are second order to like having the overarching vision in place in the first time. Uh, Professor Young, uh, so, so many follow-up questions I would love to ask, but I'm asking none of them, because the convener will uh, chastise me. Uh, thank you. <laughs> no, no, thanks very much, Bob. I'm now going to invite Jeremy in. Yeah, um, thank you. I mean, I think um, a lot of the questions I've been uh, wanting to ask about, to be honest, but I would like to go back, if I can, um, to, to Corrine, to ask a question um, in regard to kind of dependency or blocking out other groups coming into the sector, because I've been interested to know from a Robertson Trust perspective, you know, you obviously get lots of applications from lots of different people. Um, if you're funding for a three, five-year period, if I come along with an entrepreneurial idea, 
am I frozen out, or how, how do I persuade you that I'm worth funding if you're already funding X number of groups? Uh, again, just if you can keep it fairly brief, so I don't get on the wrong side of the convener either. <laughs> Yeah, no bother. Um, I suppose it is a challenge. There, there is a trade-off. We we are um, grappling just now with you know how we either do we either sort of go go wide with our funding, as has been the case for us um, to date, funding a number of organisations with smaller amounts of funding, or do we go deep, so providing five-year funding, higher level of awards, most closely aligned to our mission um, that is sort of likely to achieve greatest impact. Um, we we don't like to kind of create dependency on our funding. We're often um, one of a number of funders in the mix. We do fund a mixture of kind of organisations that are new to us with, with innovative requests or organisations that we've funded sort of year in, year out, um, just sort of doing what they do. Um, so there is a, a fine balance to be had. It's something that we are, um, yeah, as I say, kind of considering just now. I think it's likely that we will start to make more um, larger, longer-term awards with a sharper focus aligned to our mission, but that absolutely is a, a trade-off there. Okay, very briefly, just for the free funding organisations, say, what forward planning? So do you know what your budget will be in year two and year three from here? Or are you working with availabilities as well? Presumably it depends how many people buy lottery tickets, Neil, is it? It absolutely depends how many people buy lottery tickets. Um, I would encourage you all to do so. Um, we, our budgets are based on forward projections agreed with um, the Gambling Commission, um, but we also uh, carry a balance in the National Lottery Distribution Fund, which gives us confidence that we can meet the commitments we've already made projected forward. Um, a couple of things I'd say on, on dependency and on long-term funding. We fund on an average grant length of, of three years and more, but around 30% of the folk we fund in any given year are new, to, new customers to us. So, so that um, suggests that you don't necessarily lock folk out once you get that rhythm. And the key to that is not long-term funding, it's the fact that we operate rolling grant programmes, so we don't have deadlines that fall off. And we also take a relational approach. We talk to people about what they want to do and where they will fit in our funding model. And I think the other thing to bear in mind around that is I'm really conscious that the third sector itself is massively diverse in terms of size of organisation and sophistication of organisation, and the communities and places that we serve across Scotland have different needs and require different mechanisms. So funding at the scale we fund at, which is around £60 to £70 million pounds a year in Scotland, requires a, a, a series of grant-making solutions to work with different organisations trying to do different things. Garden and her colleagues at Robertson Trust would, uh, would be the same. Um, so I don't worry hugely about folk with good ideas being locked out. There is always more, sadly, more good ideas than resources to make those good ideas happen. But it feels to me that there is scope and space for people to bring those ideas to us and to have a sensible conversation. Thank you, Governor. Okay. Lovely. Thank you very much. I'm now going to invite Paul O'Kanan. Thank you. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, in the evidence we've taken thus far, we've, we've been interested in um, approaches to um, accountability, I suppose, and transparency in terms of flexible funding. Uh, and we know there's a variance of views around um, uh, unrestricted, uh, unrestricted funding models. Um, so, uh, so I suppose that we're interested in how you ensure that accountability and transparency is there in the use of flexible, unrestricted funding, but without overburdening organisations in terms of the reporting requirements, because I think that's kind of where we've heard a lot of evidence. And when we took evidence in person with uh, uh, lots of different organisations in the sector, that's what they, they spoke to us about. So I wonder if you might offer a view on that. And I don't know, Erica, would you like to start? Sure, I'll start. Um, so I, I'll start by saying it's, of course, not unreasonable to ask organisations that are receiving money and receiving public money to provide information about what they're using the money for and that the money is being used effectively. Um, I think the real issue is that the requests need to be proportionate. So what you will often see is that the reporting framework will be the same for 
10,000 pounds is for 250,000 pounds or 100,000 pounds versus a million pounds. Um, and it's very easy for funders, especially where maybe they don't have expertise in designing reporting and designing funds, to ask for everything they might be interesting, everything a minister might, they think a minister might ask for, for example. And it's, there's a power imbalance where the organizations that are being funded find it difficult to push back. So I think funders need to accept some risk. Um, they need to acknowledge that there are costs associated with this approach. Um, and ultimately, the impact of adding cost in is that um, the end users of services, you know, that there are fewer services to be provided. Um, I think fundamentally, this can be managed through long-term relationship-based fund management. Um, and there are practical things that can be done and that we do. So you can co-produce the reporting framework with the people receiving the, the, the funding um, to make sure it's fit for purpose. I think, you know, we talk about unrestricted funding, but there's also just, um, you need to be focused on the outcomes. So you can have flexible but restricted funding that is outcome focused. So you're not focusing on the inputs per se, you're focusing on what you're trying to achieve and are you achieving that? Um, and that's what we try to do. Um, so I think it's really about appropriate, proportionate reporting. It needs to be focused on impact and the onus is on funders to make sure that the things are designed as they should be. Thanks. Um, Neil, in terms of the, the National Lottery's kind of response, um, you've spoken about the need for uh, a, a more equitable dynamic, I think, between mm -hmm. funder and those who are funded and reporting back. And I, I, I think um, looking at the relationships is kind of the important part. So uh, would you mind kind of saying something about National Lottery's experience of that? Certainly. Um, we've tried to develop a relational approach to our funding, acknowledging that there's a power relationship there and there are really strong cultural ideas about what, how we all behave around money and, and all of that. And so, so trying to acknowledge that as a starting point and then work with people in a sensible way to, I suppose the whole business of funding and grant making has lots of that power relationship ingrained in it. And what we want to try and get to is a partnership approach that says we are trying to Funders are trying to put money to work in communities, and we are dependent on organisations and communities in doing that. And so trying to acknowledge that and work in a way that, that is helpful is, is what we try to do. So we've we structured our teams so that we are relatively local and we have continuity of engagement with organisations, because lots of that accountability lies in talking to folk, knowing what they're up to, understanding their challenges. That enables you to be flexible in then how you, as Eric has described, in how you manage um, grants. And a couple of other things I'd say on this. There are opportunities for better funder collaboration. We've, we've tried a few times to, to do things like harmonise grant reporting, and we do say we will accept a report you've created for another funder at the National Lottery Fund rather than writing as bespoke one for us. And we've been on a journey about that. We used to we used to properly make folk write an awful lot, and we we don't now. And and so you know, better was to say if a sinner repented. Um, so so I think we've we've done well there. Um, and the other thing I would say, and and this is a real challenge for funders, and something I think we're only starting to have a conversation and understand is the need to review approaches to risk. What are the assumptions upon which we are assessing risk? So my job is to balance excellent customer service for folk who want to do things in communities with lottery money and the rules around managing public money well. And um, in, in doing that, we, we talk about assessing risk. What is the risk of loss? What is the risk of error? What is the risk of fraud? What is the risk of outcomes not being achieved? And the experience over, a long, over my long career in funding is that the risk of those things happening, while difficult to manage when it happens, is relatively unusual. And I think there's probably something for us all to reflect on in terms of genuinely evidence-based approaches to risk and how you manage that. Um, Karen, I wonder if um, I might ask you to comment just from the point of view that, you know, Robertson have advocated um, to increase the amount of, I suppose, unrestricted funds, um, core funds, I, I, and just to get a sense of how you've adapted, perhaps, for, uh, reporting requirements for those receiving that funding, and just any feedback I think you've had from uh, people who've been in receipt of Robertson funding in terms of those changes or what further changes they might want to see. Yeah, happy to comment on that. Um, 
So I think um, in terms of, of how we approach things, I think a couple of the points that Neil and Erica mentioned there are really important for us as well um, about placing our trust in funded organisations to deliver what is needed for the people and communities that they support. If their work is really aligned with our mission, we can be confident that what they deliver is using our money well to bring about the change that, that we want to see with our funding. So it means we don't need to impose burdensome reporting requirements on our funded organisations and taking that relational approach as well. If we are clear with organisations about what they can expect from us, that we are open to hearing where things don't go well, don't go to plan, but what did you learn? Um, that really fosters accountability and transparency. Um, so we find that we don't need to have long, you know, like reporting forms. Um, we ask sort of consistent questions about what did you do, what difference did it make, and, and what did you learn? And we find that that's enough. We do get good um, feedback from our funded organisations. You know, we run an annual grant holder survey. Um, we have kind of online surveys post submission of your your end of year report. Um, so we feel we have a good balance between proportion proportionality and due diligence. Um, and we also find that what, what we gather um, satisfies our audit requirements too, which is which is really helpful. So. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if uh, Professor Young wants to offer anything in terms of uh, your view of reporting and, and how I suppose that information can be used better perhaps from organisations or are you quite I happy think we've to... got a very strong evidence base <laughs> yeah. in Scotland of how to approach that. I think I'm just coming back to Neil's um, question on response about risk. I think as an overarching question, where does the risk sit? Like historically it's like the public sector is risk averse because you need to deliver public services, fair enough. And it's like third sector organisations, like foundations, they can take the risk. So they could be the risk taker there. So the question is, um, rather than trying to have an overarching approach that addresses all grant making and funding for the third sector, we need a portfolio of different time frames, of different risk levels and different approaches. I think the complexity there is not. Oh, can I just like, sorry. Yes. Can I just like, Pierre, and one other thing, it's like, because we're talking about long-term funding as if that was long-term. Yeah, in three to five years, if you look at the policy perspective, it isn't long-term. Yeah. It is like shortest, shortest term. So if you look at policy change, like six years is short-term before you normally can really see impact. 14 years is medium, 20 to 40 years is long-term. So if you talk about long-term funding, I think you need to define what we mean by that one. That's really helpful, and um, thank you. Can okay, you know? <clears throat> thank you. Before I bring Rose in, I believe Kevin would like to come in. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'd like to tease this out a little bit further, um, convener, because um, Karen mentioned uh, audit requirements. Uh, we've heard uh, about risk there too, um, and there's also trust factors at play here. Um, but the key thing in, in, in all of this at the end are those outcomes, which are sometimes hard to measure, let's be honest with you. Um, you can say that you fed 50 kids in Dundee next week, for example, but the outcomes of doing that are much greater in a lot of cases than just feeding 50 kids. So how do we get all of these balances right? Are we getting them right? Are audit requirements sometimes too rigorous? Um, is the appetite for risk sometimes too low? Are we trusting enough of communities and organisations in terms of uh, utilising funding properly? Um, and are we actually measuring outcomes well? I know that's a, a fair amount there, but I think these, this is the nub of all of this as far as I'm concerned. Can we maybe go to Professor Yoon first, please? Sure, like responding like um, what the Deputy Convener said earlier on, so many points to discuss there. Um, now, to get started, I think, how do we get that all right? I don't know. For that, we need a national conversation about what is the role of the third sector. It's like, what's the vision for the third sector? It's about merely public service delivery. It's about propping up the public sector. It's about filling in gaps that government can't fulfill. Or is it about innovation, alternative solutions, developing communities, providing advocacy? That's something that needs to be developed collectively. Um, as regards the question about are we trusting enough, 
in organization studies, there's a saying like, organization that trusts people get people they can trust. So it's like there's something to explore on that front. So just an overarching observation, though, if you look at all the outcomes, and if you look at the history of how grantees, like those who receive the grant, report and respond to the grant makers, they normally are not honest in the way that they're, no, that's not the right word. I rephrase that one, they rephrase that one. It's like, they be euphemistically. Yeah? They're trying to be as positive like as possible. So if you look at the all evidence base here, it's like they're highlighting things are creaking. Now if grantees say that like things are creaking, it's like things must be pretty bad because it will only be the tip of the icebergs. So for that, as I say, it's like I think we do need a wider conversation about the vision and role for the third sector. Thank you. Karen, please. Um, yeah, I think in terms of audit requirements, obviously we do need to ensure that our, our fund is accounted for, but that shouldn't be the primary focus of um, how, you know, why we ask organisations to, to tell us about uh, how they've used their funding and their work. There's definitely more, I think, that we could do to place our trust in funded organisations and maybe think differently about how they, they report to us. But the point about measuring outcomes, I think, is a really valid one, particularly when we're talking about unrestricted funding. How do we measure the outcomes of that? What is it we're interested in? Is it the benefits to the organisations in terms of the, the unrestricted funding and what it enables them to do? Or is it the benefits to the people and communities they support? Um, it's something that we are developing our thinking on just now. We are trying to think more about um, differences in terms of our contribution to those rather than attribution, recognising it's not going to be just our funding. Um, that helps to, to make those differences. So I don't think that we have got the answer to that just now, um, but we are, as I say, developing our thinking. We're looking to others in terms of what they're doing and best practice. So we'd be happy to share any learning that we, we do kind of bring together on that as, as our work progresses. Thank you. Uh, Erica, please. So um, what I would say is that the shorter the length of the funding, the harder it is to figure out what's going on and what the outcomes are and to collect data. Um, I also think that what it, I, I see all of this as part of a whole. So you take, you take flexibility in funding, you add long-term funding, and you add skilled relationship-based fund so, management. So, so I, 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 want, I want to challenge you on that point, because sometimes you said sometimes the shorter the funding, the more difficult it is to measure outcomes. But sometimes in terms of flexibility, and one-off funds or a change of funding, you get positive outcomes that you can see very, very quickly. Is that not the case? Well... I'll, I'll give you an example. Yes, please do. <laughs> um, because uh, as a, a minister, we in, uh, I introduced um, a, a fund whereby frontline staff could help homeless people quickly with small amounts of cash. And you could see differences very quickly there. Um, a, 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 an example, uh, you know, folk not having the right official paperwork, a wee bit of money to sort that out. And then you can see positive outcomes very quickly because a lot of things are resolved. So sometimes that level of flexibility can make really positive outcomes quickly. The difficulty in that one is that lots and lots of folk were saying to me, how do you audit that? <laughs> um, and far too much emphasis uh, on the audit requirements and worrying um, mm -hmm. that we can trust folk. Yeah. So sometimes I think short term, we can measure outcomes quite quickly. Well, you can measure outcomes, and, and that type of, and I would agree that that you know that's thinking about well, what what's the risk ultimately if you give people two hundred pounds or whatever? You, the risk is you lose two hundred pounds, which actually you know offset by the benefit of many many people benefiting from that money is 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 small, but that's more of a kind of emergency thing. It doesn't change the underlying system where people are in a position where they don't have the right paperwork well, or they're they're so homeless. Uh, again, the I'm going to play devil's advocate because sometimes it does change the long term. Sometimes little things can make big change, but we don't necessarily measure this well, do we not? 
I think there's a place for all different types and amounts of funding, and there are interventions, you know, immediate, short, sharp cash interventions can have value. I'm definitely not arguing against that, but what I would say is that if, you, if, if ultimately we're trying to address poverty, long-term deprivation, those require complex interventions that require longer-term funding and people who really know what they're doing, working with people to make change. So um, I think you, you need to have different profiles of time, amounts of money, and objectives. Neil, please. I suppose just to build on what Erica said, I think long-term support for the little things that are effective is even better. Um, so we know that cash first approaches can work well and yeah. can be transformative for people. Often when you want to get into the root causes of why folk found themselves in that fix, you need to be around for longer in that relationship. Um, you asked, are we measuring outcomes well? My answer is sometimes. Um, what could funders and the organisations we work with do, do better on that? I think there's a few straightforward things to do, actually. One is just to resource the work. If you want to place important <laughs> requirements of an or, on an organisation, you need to recognise that as, a, as an organisation with power and resources, you are asking an organisation to do something for you, and you should cost that into your model. Um, to be clear about what you're after in your design, so folk have a, a framework within which to try and report and understand against those outcomes. And I think there's something about funders collaborating and also funders investing in the right skills and systems themselves to ask the right questions in the most efficient way. So I think you do, we do see bad examples of funder reporting where folk are not designing what they are asking well, they're not using technology well, um, and they're kind of stumbling towards we need to know what's going on but not being clear enough. So, so very briefly, convener, following up on that point, um, and uh, you know, it comes back to some of the things that were said previously as well. In terms of measuring outcomes, and mm. obviously you guys are going back to organisations who are reporting, are we asking people themselves enough around about what they think that funding has yeah. made uh, in terms of a difference to them? So we, we fund out. And here, just before um, Neil comes in, I know that Professor Young had his hand up. He was wanting to come in on well, the last. But uh, if you want to answer that, Neil, and then um, just to make yeah. you aware, I'll, I'll bring Professor okay. Young back in. Thank you. Thank you. Two things on that. One, um, specific projects, we'll do that in different ways. So we'll use different um, methodologies and techniques to, to talk to people about distance travel. So we, we fund a lot of work with young people, for example, around you know building confidence, positive outcomes. And you can see big changes at those points in people's lives. We also fund a lot of support for vulnerable people where you would maybe use specific like um, multi-step programmes and measure progress in that way. And that's grand. And it comes back to a point that Professor Young made earlier which is, are we asking the right questions of people when we're doing this as well? Uh, maybe Professor Young wants to come in and answer that and make his point as well, convener. I think Tobias is okay, by the way. <laughs> um, so, say a couple of things. <laughs> the first of all, coming back to your um, challenge to Erica. So, yes, you address a short-term issue, but you didn't address why the person was homeless in the first place. So, I think that comes back to alleviation versus strategic change. It's like the tension there. Um, secondly, um, coming back to the question of trust, because in essence, what we're looking at here is a really nice sort of like ecosystem. It's like if you provide long-term funding, it's like all these organizations are in a symbiotic relationship. If I'm a funder, actually in order to achieve my aims, I'm reliant on the third sector organization to be successful. So there's a huge codependency. By that, if I, then I've got long-term relationships, I can develop, I can learn, there's a mutual benefit in that, and I can develop trust as well. It's like it's a natural cycle there. And then the third aspect around measuring one, I mean, if you look at the history of impact measurement in the UK, I think back in 2014, the Home Office had, or the Cabinet Office, had a total impact tool that they put out like for funders. And the idea being that you should really only fund those aspects that provide the most impact. But in how far there's meaningful measurement, I think, again, it's another conversation. And here, quite often, working with people who receive grants on the bottom end, co-designing measurement frameworks is actually the way forward, rather than trying to impose them, I think. Grant, thank you, Kimbina. Okay. 
Okay, thanks, Tobias. And, and I'm going to bring in Rose McCall now. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, convener. Um, yeah, this has been in incredibly interesting. Um, I'm going to ask you back a little bit, if that's okay, because um, the theme that I'm, I'm working on is, is benefits uh, and challenges of long-term funding. Um, so we've, we've heard a lot already about the benefits of, of that, but again, it's, it's teasing the bits out. Risk-aware, risk-averse. Local authorities, government, very much on the risk-averse side rather than risk-aware. It's, it's in our nature. Um, and it doesn't surprise me that Glasgow City Council are, are in their submission are the one that are highlighting some of the major concerns about this. So looking forward at that, that juxtaposition, and, and I'll come to yourself, Tobias, if I, if I can first, because you mentioned the relationship Knowing it's systemic, knowing that this is how government works and how it's been, it's going to be really difficult to turn that tanker. How can we keep or move from a risk-averse to a risk-aware process in a government structure? And how do we look at funding in, in, in that way, Cons considering the concerns and challenges that, that the Glasgow City Council have come across in their submissions? Can I have 30 seconds thinking time, please? Uh, yes, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. I know, it's, I know it's a big question, but certainly Glasgow City Council have certainly highlighted that there's barriers they believe in leadership and management um, as, to, as to how that long-term funding process would, would take place. And I think it does fall back onto the risk-averse, risk-aware process that, that we all work under. I, I get that funding from, uh, from your processes is very much risk-aware, but government and local government is very risk averse. We have to follow the public pound. We have to be accountable to taxpayers. It is a different set of requirements rather than an auditing requirement. So I guess I'm asking, is it possible? I don't know. Okay. But I mean, the issue is the tension, isn't it? Because are we expecting Glasgow City Council to take on a third sector funding perspective? And Glasgow City Council is not designed to support it's like the third sector yeah. as an advocacy organisation, something. So I think there's something about unpicking the conflicting responsibilities that needs to be clarified. Um, as regards the benefits around long-term funding, I think there's a huge opportunity around knowledge sharing, yeah. um, because like both organisations benefit on that front. There's also a huge issue around the usual suspects. Like once you've attracted yeah. funding, it's like, are you more likely to attract funding again? So. Yeah. I can't provide the answer yet. <laughs> I'll go back to the ivory tower and come back with it. Well, that's lovely. I'll give you longer than 30 seconds to think about it. Um, no, that's fine. If, if I could then come to yourself, Neil, then, um, because, uh, again, in the submission from the National Lottery, um, there, there's a comment that it may limit funders' ability to quickly address unexpected uh, crisis, as it happened. Um, again, given that we're looking at this whole process, is how maybe the government structures look at long-term funding. Um, could you explain a little bit more about that crisis problem mm -hmm. and how could the government structure get around that? Yeah. Um, sure. Um, and I think it's important to note that local government does have real challenges around accountability that are different to mm -hmm. um, independent funders. Um, for us, th that, that risk lies in, obviously, if you you have no contingency in your budget because you've committed as much as you possibly can in order to be as flexible and as long term as you can. When crisis, crises turn up yeah. um, and stick around, unfortunately, um, it's harder to respond. So we were able, um, during COVID and subsequent cost of living challenges, to vary grants that were live to the tune of £10 million one way or another. Yeah. And what that enabled existing organisations to do was move really quickly to shift what they did and respond to communities. Um, so I suppose our point there is that having some of that contingency allows you to respond to a crisis. And the risk, and this is the risk that loads of third sector bodies face right now, is how much do you hang on for a rainy day and how much do you recognise that it's raining right now? Um, and, I, and that's definitely the dilemma we see in, in funded organisations. We see it loud and clear in things like the third sector tracker. Um, what larger institutions like ourselves can do, what, what government can do, is um, use bigger levers and greater financial capacity through to flex in crisis. So the, the scale of our investment, for example, um, is a manageable scale for us. Um, and that's one of the unique things that um, the state can do better in this space than anybody else. Um, and so it's, it's worth hanging on to the value of that. 
Excellent. Thank you. Um, Karen, I'm, I'm going to come to you just to get your opinion on, on that sort of side of it as well, and I'll, I'll equally give Erica a chance. But it's really knowing the restrictions that government has, if we look at long-term funding, knowing that we have to go back to the public pound, knowing we have to be uh, accountable to taxpayers, is it, again, what, what's your opinion on it? Is, is it possible? Yeah, I mean, I think at the Trust we're in the fortunate position that we're an independent funder. We've got a relatively secure budget, so it's easier for us to implement some of these things and I appreciate it as for, for government. But I wanted to come in on the point about being risk averse and that point about maybe there's barriers um, in sort of awarding longer term funding if there's um, a gap in skills and sort of leadership and management in the sector. It may be a simplistic way of looking at it, but we would probably look and see, well, what are these barriers and are there ways that we could help to overcome them. So is there training and support that we could put in place for leadership in the third sector? Are there existing programmes out there that we could put funding into to help up skills so that we then can be confident in putting um, a longer term funding out? Um, and that point about responding to crisis, I think probably it's similar to what Neil said. It's not always about being able to provide additional funding. It's about where you can bring in flexibility. So for example, during COVID, we lifted all restrictions on our revenue grants so that organisations could respond flexibly. Um, so we just say it's thinking about um, what, what works within the structures that you're you're operating within. That's very helpful. Thank you. And Erica, lastly, your, your comments on that risk aware risk aware um, position and equally leadership and, and management issues. Right. Um, so I think we've managed this in through COVID. So we have experience of being flexible during a crisis, very recent experience. We And, and I think there's a widely accepted view that the third sector responded brilliantly in that, in that environment and the, the risks didn't materialize. Um, what I would say is one way that Inspiring Scotland actually, I think, I think adds value in the sector is that as managers of funds for the Scottish Government and for local authorities, we are able to absorb some of that risk and put in place the knowledge, relationship and trust that's required to make the whole thing work. The, you know, a local council, is, as Tobias said, isn't set up to do that. And the Scottish Government is not set up to have relationships with individual small charities and understand how well they're working. So they place our, their trust in us. That trust is renewed over time. And we work with the organisations to make sure that what should be happening is, is happening and where it may not be happening, take, taking measures to, to address that and support capacity and improve the capacity in the, in the sector. So I think it's about understanding what you want to have happen and then putting in place the, the resources in the right places to make that happen. Yeah, and, and who delivers it? Sorry, just briefly, Tobias, I know you want to come back in and then I'll pass back to Kavita. Yes, Thank sorry, you. sorry, very quickly, because I think there's actually a very long-standing set of experiments that were carried out in the Scottish sector. I think the Robertson Trust 10 years ago hosted a forum around bridge funding and alternative funding models for public sector and public services. So it's maybe about like revisiting some of these existing historic mm -hmm. databases as well. So to develop a portfolio rather than just having a like solution. That's very helpful. Thank you very much and thank you, convener. Okay. That's lovely. Thank you. I'm now going to invite Katie Clarkin. Thanks. Thank you. And I want to ask about inflation, um, because it's obviously important um, that third sector organisations are able to function properly um, and provide services, but also be good employers and meet minimum standards, including the Fair Work Agenda. So how do you think inflation-linked funding can be integrated to provide financial stability over multi-year funding periods, and what role do funders have in that? Um, I don't know who would like to start. Maybe Neil? Sure. Um, we, we do this. We, we expect people to recognise that their costs will increase year on year when they apply to us for multi-year funding, and if they haven't recognised that, we ask them the question. Um, so I think if you want to be a multi-year funder, you have to recognise that inflation exists. It's, it's pretty straightforward to put in place tools that enable grant applicants to make uh, sensible estimates. You can provide parameters around that. 
And I think actually in the past few years, funders probably know a wee bit more about the cost base in the third sector than we previously did because we've been focused on it mm -hmm. um, as a result of, of the impact of COVID and loss of income and as a result of um, the uh, spikes in inflation and costs that, mm -hmm. that we've seen across the board. So, so, you know, if we fund a capital project, we'd expect to put contingency into it, um, and we do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think sometimes with revenue funding, there's a presumption that people can, can juggle around and make magic stuff happen. But the reality is energy costs go up, um, premises costs go up, um, everything goes up, and we should, we should plan for that. So um, we make multi-year grants that take account of inflation and... I, I really think that that's just the responsible thing to do if you're a mm -hmm. multi-year fund. So you think there's lessons to be learnt from organisations such as yourself? Y yeah, I mean, uh, there's always somebody doing it better, um, uh -huh. probably, th than we are. Um, and Karen will explain why she's doing it better soon, I'm, I'm sure. But yes, there are, there are models and lessons, and we know how to do this. I don't know if Karen would want to come in or any of the other witnesses. Karen? Yeah, thank you. I'm not sure if we're doing it better, but we do ask organisations to build it into their budget from the outset and we take it into consideration when we're um, making our awards. But one thing I would say is I think it's really important for funders to work together on this because we know that we are often one funder of many. We are not meeting an organisation's full cost, so we should all be encouraging organisations to build inflation into their budgets up front and we should all be looking at ways that we can embed that within our funding. I'm happy to leave it there unless one of the other witnesses has anything to add. If you don't mind, because I think it's absolutely like it has to be done because that's how we got in the situation we are in in the first place because of the non-profit starvation cycle, which means that like third sector organisations underreport their costs, it's like in order to attract more grants, in order to make them more attractive. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, that's lovely. Thanks very much. I'm um, now going to invite um, Marie McNair in. Thanks. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. The, the, the committee really appreciate your time here this morning. Um, I'll start um, on uh, the real living wage, um, and I'll start with yourself, Karen. In your written submission, you say you don't make um, the living uh, wage a condition of your grant holders. Can you expand on why that's the case, and can you give examples of why sort of funded programme? Uh, projects uh, may have struggled to do so? Yes, yeah, so what we think the real living wage is, is really important, along with other fair work principles, um, but we're not able to stipulate that organisations pay it um, because we, again, are one funder of many, so we're never meeting the entire um, staff costs of an organisation. We recognise that if we say that um, the salary costs that we're funding must be paid the real living wage, that creates a challenge in terms of parity um, across um, other, other staff roles within an organisation, and they may not have sufficient funding to, to do that. So I think that's another point where funders need to work together on that principle. Um, we ask organisations if they pay the real living wage and if they're accredited and what barriers they're facing around that. Um, and we think that there's more that we can do to kind of stretch our, our ambitions on that together collectively as funders. You know, we can look to the real living wage network and learn about what others are doing. So. But we do feel it's important we're not in a position um, to kind of stipulate that organisations must, must pay it. Thank you, Karen. Um, Neil, you, you were kind of similar. Obviously, you ranked um, one on that. It was quite a low priority. Can you kind of expand on why that was the case as well? Uh, yeah, um, partly because we just found it really hard to prioritise mm -hmm. um, those things. I would agree with everything Karen just said. So we are a real living wage friendly grant maker, but we are conscious that different organisations. We fund a huge range of organisations mm -hmm. from uh, an, an awful lot of our funding through the awards for all programme was very, very small um, community level organisations. Um, so we're conscious of helping people get to that stage without imposing that as a barrier to funding and things happening for them. So uh, trying to move in step with other funders. We are often a match funder with our colleagues at the Robertson Trust. Um, but Often for us, organisations will have you know, folk in other jobs that we don't fund who, mm -hmm. who then have a, a challenging position. Um, so, so we encourage people, we talk to people about it, we talk to them during the grant assessment process about it, but we don't um, require it as a condition of grant because um, while it's a good aspiration, it's also another level of inflexibility in what an organisation can then do in managing its finances. 
Thank you. Appreciate that. And Erica, I think you scored a three just um, on the reliving wage. Can you expand on your thoughts behind that? So, Inspiring Scotland is a real living wage employer, and we are very supportive of of the real living wage and the fair work commitments. What we would say um, is that what we've seen recently from the Scottish government is a, a diktat that the the grants from them in, incorporate the real living wage without any kind of uplift associated. Um, so. Uh, and it doesn't. It, so that's very challenging because if you're going to increase wages, you there will be less out, output and outcomes, um, and also doesn't recognise the complexity of how charities build their P&Ls. Um, so what what we would advocate for is a flexible approach such as that. You know that Robertson and um, the National Lottery do where it's in encouraged, but it's, um, it still maintains the autonomy of the organization. And just to give as an example of what kind of challenges come as a result of this type of thing, I'm a trustee of a charity that um, among the many things it does has a cafe, and those employees are not currently paid the real living wage, and we're working towards that, but that, that cafe it, you know, it still has to at least break even. If it doesn't break even, we can't continue to operate it. So that does that means no wages. It doesn't mean everyone gets a real living wage. So there are some economic realities that need to be acknowledged. Um, so we try to be as flexible as we possibly can while supporting the right outcomes. Thank you. It's going to be that's me. That's lovely. <clears throat> Thanks very much. I'm now going to invite um, Jeremy Balfour in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kavira, and good morning again. Well, if I can move on to the reporting process of what you expect back, which interestingly, we've got uh, one of the charities in this week is funded by, I think, at least two, if not three of you. And they were very complimentary in regard to that. It's a com it's sort of things change in a three year period. It's not, we have to read some application. It's very much a conversation. It's a, this is why we're doing it. And there's a real openness to it. How flexible are you in regard to that kind of reporting, particularly over a three-year period? Do you have strict deadlines that everything has to be reported every six months? And what works well from your perspective in making sure it's used properly? Eric, I can maybe start with you. Well, we, we manage uh, 16 funds, and if I'm honest, there are different uh, timelines and reporting processes for each one of those funds, and they, we tailor those to the how, how the fund is set up, who the funder is, and what the requirements are. Um, we, but we also generally operate a kind of continuous improvement approach. So if we set up um, reporting within a, a, a portfolio, and we, uh, we we're all we're working constantly with that portfolio, and we're finding either that it doesn't work for our needs, or that our charities are telling us that it's not quite working. Then we would adjust that and amend it over time. Um, I think we are often in a position where we are kind of taking information in and negotiating with some of our funders around what is actually necessary. And that's a big principle for us is like, don't ask for more than you need, only ask for uh, what you need, what you're going to use, and, and really be mindful of what you're asking of people and don't be extractive. Try to ensure that it's um, adding value all the time. Karen, can I bring you in? Yeah, sure. Um, so I would agree with those points Eric made about only asking for information that you need. We do have slightly different report, reporting requirements for each of our funds, but to be proportionate. It's normally annual reporting, but actually for our smallest grants or we grants for grassroots community groups, we don't ask them to report back at all. We just ask them if they want to tell us about what they did with the funding or send us pictures, then feel free. Um, we ask key questions about the differences an organisation made, um, what they, what they did, what they learned, what challenges and changes we are. We'll accept reports from other funders if an organisation finds it difficult to use our report. Um, and we can be quite flexible during the funding periods if there are restrictions on our funding that aren't working for the, the organisation or the communities that they support. The last thing that we want to do is withdraw funding and make them reapply. So we really try to work with them to understand how they can best use um, our funding to help prevent or reduce poverty and trauma in their community. Um, 
Just a couple of quick questions. I mean, going back to the start of the process, there seems to be about 101 different application forms. Is there any possibility that that could be standardised, that you know, organisations like yourselves could all get around the table and say, can we design one application form, rather than having all these different types, which then the third sector have to get slightly different information for every different application we make? Neil. Um, well, I, mean, I think this is a project that breaks down somewhere after question five. So who are you? Where are you? What are you wanting to do? Why are you wanting to do it? And who are you doing it with? Um, and, and then what happens is that organisations, because of the way they are funded or the way they're set up, particularly in terms of trusts and foundations, have specific things they need to know. Um, and we've, we've done some work on this in the past, talking about both harmonising how people report to funders and looking at can you have what, what people often call a single front door to funding. Um, and actually, during COVID, we did some really good work with our colleagues at SCVO about creating a single access point. And generally, I think that, that works OK, except that what you're doing then is creating some kind of system or artefact. And the way you access, for example, lottery funding is you phone us up and talk to us, or you send us an email. And people find that approach much more helpful, because what it allows them to do is reach a stage of having some really strong advice about whether or not they should proceed with the work of applying. And that has been quite important. So, so the idea of a clearinghouse or a, or a single point of entry has been really important. But the other sort of little discomfort risk around that is it's also a single point of no. So if you don't get in the single front door, you, you don't have other doors to knock on, and particularly around innovation, very small funds, things like that, that, that can be problematic. And then there is, um, it's probably worth just saying it out loud, there is a challenge for funders around data and data sharing mm. and, and getting all of that right as well. And um, it's, it's definitely a, a live issue. In, in doing that. So, so we do try and we, we signpost and refer across major funders as well. So if you phone us up and we don't think that the National Lottery Community Fund is for you, we might direct you to some of our other lottery distributors or, or the Robertson Trust or, or Inspiring Scotland and, and so on. Um, but the, I think it's probably important to recognise that funders have sought to do some bits of this and uh, it has it's been harder than it felt like it should have been, but for, for good reasons at the time. It's not to say we shouldn't keep um, our eyes on that prize, though. Um, and then just finally, what, one of the kind of comments that comes back from quite a lot of the third sector is you always want to see something new. So, you know, we've got to redesign what we do. So rather than carrying on, we slightly change the name or we slightly do that because there seems to be a perception that you don't keep funding unless it's a wee bit new or you bring in another organisation to do it but all the, they've got to start again well actually they could be doing well is that fair Corrine or is the third sector just moaning <laughs> Here's your leading question if you want <laughs> we do hear that often and actually um, from our perspective we will fund the tried and tested, you know, just your core service to do do what you do. Organisations that have been around for a long time, we're not looking for new and innovative work, um, although we can support that. So in terms of how we um, award our funding, it's not something that we are we are looking for. It may be that um, third sector organisations come across that um, in accessing funding from other sources, but we are more than happy to fund work that that works, that is existing, and doesn't need to be sort of turned into something new and interesting. Eric, can you? I mean, I, I think there is something fair in that across mm -hmm. across the funding landscape, and they're not just making it up and, and moaning. Um, we, you know, we have ten-year funds, so we, we we're not asking people to do something new. We're asking we're asking our charities to continue to work to the outcomes and the objectives of the fund. That being said, we do have um, when we open new funds or where we things are initiated from multiple different kinds of funding uh, funders. There does tend to be an ask for it to be new or different, and we do push back on that 
and try to push back on that because, as you say, in, in many cases, you know, we know what the solution is. We just have to keep keep on doing it. Um, so it, I think that's something where we can certainly we could push back and continue to do so. Uh, thank you. I, I suppose just for the record, I should also say I'm a trustee um, of a charity that at the moment is receiving money from the Robertson Trust. So thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and, and just before um, we finish up, um, I would like to ask each of you your views on what you think the Scottish Government could actually do in terms of working with independent funders and um, have you got any sort of best practice um, stories in place that, that you can share with us? Thank you. And I'll start with Karen first, please. Um, I think the important thing from my perspective is just to keep this dialogue open um, for us to, to try and work more closely together and, and share our learning, because I think there's a lot that, that we can learn from each other. OK, thanks, Karen. And um, Tobias? I think the same criticism that has been applied to sort of like some of the other organisational power questions applies here too, because there's a power independent like dependency between Scottish governments and those organisations. So recognising that and like trying to alleviate that. Okay, thank you. And Neil, um, I, I think I would say there are a number of um, positive bits of work that go on between Scottish government colleagues and independent funders on a range of things. We work with Hamilton Islands Enterprise to deliver a Scottish land fund on behalf of the Scottish Government and that's we've done that since twenty twelve and we enjoy a, a very sensible, helpful relationship with colleagues. So um, there are there are there are points of light and, and good things to build on. I think um, one of the most important things we can all do is is learn together, test together and, and share best practice more effectively together um, by connecting in through fora like Scottish Grant Makers or the Scottish Funders Forum, which enable funders to come together and uh, um, uh, discuss our issues. Okay, thank you. And finally, Erica. So we work very closely with the Scottish Government and um, across multiple directorates. And I, if I'm honest, I find that they are as constrained by this, these kind of practices as, as we are. And I, I think would like to see it change. We have very constructive um, conversations and they want to make the right things happen. So there's no question or doubt about that in my mind. Um, what we, the feedback we get is that um, multi-year funding uh, can't be delivered because of the lack of security of their own funding and often that decision, those decisions are made at a very high level, not at the level of the people we deal with. Um, we are hoping the multi-year spending review will make a difference in that, um, but also it's worth saying that, you know, pre there's precedent for giving three and five year grants. Um, national and local government in the past have, have uh, historically given those amounts of money, so we're not exactly sure why it's come to what it has, but we, I think we have a shared objective in changing it. Okay, that's lovely. <clears throat> um, thank you very much. So, um, thanks for, for basically um, sharing your views with us today. It's been really, really interesting. I think all the members here will have found it really worthwhile as well. So, and we will be um, basically reporting on the evidence um, uh, going forward um, that we've heard and, and taking that forward in November as well. So, <clears throat> but before we do that, um, and before we move into sorry private session, um, I would just like to advise um, that Rose McCall um, will be replaced by Liz Smith on the committee following decision time today. So I would therefore like to put on the record that the committee thanks Rose McCall for the valuable contributions that you've made and you're going to be sorely missed so you're um, so um, I don't know if you want to come in Rose at all no, just happy to say um, I've, I've really enjoyed being on this committee. Thank you very much, convener. Thank you to everybody um, for helping me and um, for some really interesting topics that we've, we've, we've looked at over the last year. Um, I'm sorry to be leaving, but thank you very much for uh, going on the record there, convener. Thank, well, you. <clears throat> thank you once again. So we'll now move into private session um, as our public business is now concluded. Thank you.